Uh, so um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Allah for uh, inviting me to uh, give this talk today. Uh, I'm just going to plug in a uh, microphone so that... Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Brilliant. Thank yes, you very can. much. Yes. So, yes, well, uh, I thought I would talk uh, today uh, about Walter Benjamin, uh, history and post-colonial literature. Now, uh, Walter Benjamin is not uh, a theorist that you would automatically assume um, to be relevant for the study of post-colonial literature for uh, a consideration of post-colonial uh, literatures um, and his name has now been <coughs> with various uh, studies of post-colonial uh, literature and I hope to explore uh, some of the reasons for that uh, and mainly I will be focusing on the way in which uh, he understands history and why that is relevant uh, for reading of diasporic or post-colonial literatures. So Walter Benjamin uh, understands the limitations in reading modernity or the Enlightenment project as the linear progression towards some future higher point of civilization. A linearity Benjamin calls empty time or universal history and an affair of obscurantists. So Benjamin's project is one in which he says that the object of history is to be blasted out of the continuum of historical succession. So all of these quotations that you can see on the screen now are from Walter Benjamin's uh, arcade project in particular Convolute N, which is the theoretical heart of this uh, enormous unfinished project, the Arcades Project. And it's in this section on the theory of knowledge, theory of progress, that Benjamin articulates uh, a way in which we can think about history. And I will come on to the way in which it relates to post-colonial uh, literature uh, later on. But firstly, this idea that the object of history, it's the first quotation on your screen, the object of history is to be blasted out of the continuum of historical succession is one uh, that uh, I'm interested in. Uh, what he is arguing uh, when he makes this uh, point is that rather than think about uh, history as working in a linear, progressive fashion, some kind of um, moment of perfection, but what we have to do is to really think about history and the way in which the object um, can be, as he says, blasted out of the continuum of historical succession. So he's really thinking about a non-linear conceptualization of history. So in the Arcade Project, he insists on how uh, he refuses, uh, he has a resolute refusal of the concept of timeless truth and that is for him in order and that's the second quotation on the screen there. He says this is necessary for the materialist historian engaged in the clear-sighted examination of history, uh, a detrius from which the revolutionary moment may be salvaged. So he reorients Marxism away from reductive science and its dialectical uh, certainties. And he asserts that historical materialism, and this is the third quotation on your screen, historical materialism must renounce the epic element in history. It blasts the epoch out of the reified continuity of history. But it also explodes the homogeneity of the epoch, interspersing it with ruins that is, with the present. So rather than uh, moments or objects in an evolutionary history, once in the ruined form and no longer idealized or fetishized by uh, commodification of capitalism, the utopian origins for him of the object are rediscovered as an aura. 
and their true meaning, and therefore the true meaning of history itself can be found. So in Benjamin's formulation, the meaning of history is to be excavated from that which survives in the present, even as the ruin, a historical moment, an object, or as in the arcade project, architectural structures, the significance of which can only be truly understood in the instant of the present. Even then, the truth of the past is momentary, a shock that emerges, and this is the final quotation on the screen, the past emerges suddenly in a flash. What has been is to be held fast as an image flashing up in the now of recognisability. The rescue that is carried out by these means, and only by these, cannot be solely for the sake of what in the next moment is already irretrievably lost. So the impulse for this project was uh, the Parisian arcades. This is the cover of the arcades project. And uh, you'll see the, these are the Parisian arcades. And really what he was thinking about was the way in which when these were built in Paris, uh, they almost immediately became obsolete as temples of consumerism. But he wants to recover them as structures and from that recover a lost object from the past at the point of ruination and it's from that that we can uh, recover history from this lost past object and this last into the present and we can understand um, in a way history and even the present in terms of uh, understanding uh, this uh, recovering this point of ruination. Now, of course, the Parisian arcade seems a long way away from post-colonial literature, but really it's this idea of recovery of a past moment and the way it might last the future. So if we want to, for example, think about what is happening America right now, um, uh, following the um, <laughs> way in which that is the past uh, that has its origins in slavery as erupting into the present, that it's, uh, in, in, and that we can perhaps, by returning to the past, understand um, the present. So the idea is to make use of the past its obsolete and discarded moments um, and through that we must uh, recover the ruins uh, and remember them but not in a chronological narrative. Now um, I supervised uh, Ala Halbosi's um, PhD uh, thesis and he worked on the way in which uh, the beloved Toni Morrison's novel seminal neo-slave novel um, worked in a non-chronological way. It was recovering a moment of history, but not in a straightforward linear narrative form. And I'll come back uh, to that uh, later. So, in order for the past not to be touched for the present, there must be no continuity between them. So Benjamin's understanding of time, history and knowledge is contingent and non-linear. And it's in the recovery and crucially the remembrance of the discarded objects that possibilities for truth lie. So it's a matter of exposing the layers in the palimpsest of meaning to illuminate the relationship between the past and the present. So he writes, history is not simply a science but also and not least a form of remembrance. What science is determined, remembrance can modify. So history is a form of remembrance. And again, if we return to the example of Tony Morrison's neo-slave narrative, Beloved, we see that it's the remembrance of uh, this moment 
the moment of slavery um, that constitutes history. And then he talks about, he is still a materialist, but being a dialectician means having the wind of history in one's sails, the sails of the concepts. It is not enough, however, to have sails at one's disposal. What is decisive is knowing the art of setting them. And it's Benjamin's use of sailing imagery that I find arresting. This idea that um, really we can set the sails um, in order to uh, understand history, to catch the, catch the wind of history in a way. The sails of the concepts. Uh, what you have to know is how to set them. Uh, and of course, in this arresting image, it, the notion that we must set the sails in a certain way in order to catch the true meaning of history. We have a metaphor that resounds in the writing of post-colonial writers who lay out voices emanating from the middle passage, the middle passage of slavery from Africa, the Caribbean and the Americas, to form a palimpsest of lived experience, often in the form of journals, letters and testimony, or in Morrison's case, the neo-slave narrative, beloved, that together constitute a, a materiality of the diaspora and imperial conquest. Now, if we just hold that idea of the dialectician and having the wind of history in one's sails and setting the sails, um, going to make the link between that and post-colonial theory and the work of Paul Gilroy. Paul Gilroy, um, sociologist, um, most famous for the Black Atlantic, you have the image on your screen there, modernity and double consciousness. In his study, The Black Atlantic, um, he actually uses uh, as the preface to the book, uh, Benjamin's uh, quotation um, about setting the sails of history. And because uh, Gilroy is concerned with the Black Atlantic, the Middle Passage in a way, uh, and the Black Atlantic constituting the culture that emanated from uh, the Middle Passage, he uh, uses the ship and at the beginning of the study of Black Atlantic, he says that his purpose is to locate the ship, the ship that carried uh, the slaves uh, and that went to Africa to transport slaves. His purpose is to locate the ship as the focal point for his analysis of the transnational, transcultural, creative expressions of the Black Atlantic. Expressions which form a counterculture to modernity its linear time and the dualism that informed the Enlightenment separation of politics and ethics. So artists and intellectuals working within this aesthetic, and he includes Tony Morrison um, as an exemplar of Black Atlantic creativity. So those artists and intellectuals working within this Black Atlantic aesthetic employ memory and alternative histories to disrupt the idea of the linearity of history as progression. And again, we can see that perhaps events in America very recently have shown that um, history is not this linear uh, form of progression for many, um, that uh, there is uh, the, the, the idea of progress is um, one of modernity's uh, myths. So, Existing within modernity itself, its expressive culture originating in the slave system, integral to the development of the West, of the Black Atlantic, nevertheless transcends modernity in its delineations of history, memory and time, and is, to return to Benjamin, the corrective that resets the sale of history. And it's in its hybridity uh, the intermixture of ideas um, that gains its expression from both Western and non-Western artistic and philosophical traditions. 
um, again, uh, Dr. Aller in his uh, PhD thesis, uh, talked about the way in which African, i.e. non-Western uh, folklore and so on, combined with Western philosophical traditions to create this African-American identity. So in that hybrid mixture of Western and non-Western artistic and philosophical traditions, the Black Atlantic is inherently anti-nationalist and provides a utopian model in its creative articulations of trauma, memory and survival. So the dislocation that was engendered by the Middle Passage can thus be reformulated. The sea, which is borderless, flowing and unidirectional, serves as a metaphor for the wide-ranging and multiple explorations of emerging subjectivities, such as the African-American subjectivity. So for Paul Gilroy, uh, Tony Morrison's beloved um, reformulates the relationship between rational, scientific and enlightened Euro-American thought and the supposedly primitive outlook of prehistorical, cultureless and uh, bestial uh, African slaves. So it's a reformulation, he says, of the African-American experience as, uh, the, as the slave sublime. So I'll come back to that in a moment, but just on this slide here, I've got a sort of summary of what I'm talking about from Gilroy's perspective. So Paul Gilroy in the Black Atlantic opposes nationalist or ethnically absolute approaches. Um, so he eschews any kind of forms of uh, national, uh, nationalism, for example. Um, and he says that we should uh, take the Atlantic as one single complex unit of analysis uh, and use it to provide an explicitly transnational and intercultural perspective. And following Gilroy, the Black Atlantic now includes the work of intellectual. So for Gilroy, Again, we're talking about remembrance here. It specifies that uh, challenges do apprehend mutable forms that can redefine the idea of culture through a reconciliation with movement and complex dynamic variation. And as I said earlier, for Gilroy, Tony Morrison's beloved reformulates the relationship between rational, scientific and enlightened Euro-American thought those ideas of the Enlightenment and the modernity, supposedly primitive battle, prehistorical, cultural. Dr. Justine, I'm, I'm terribly sorry for interrupting you here. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Is there any possibility that you can raise your voice? Some of the participants yeah. says that they, have, okay. they are having difficulties that hearing you. Yeah. Is that better? Yes, I believe. Yes. I think I've got the mic. Getting closer, closer probably to the voice yeah. to make it clearer. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear that? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I'm making the point here that Paul Gilroy's conceptualization of the Black Atlantic, you can hear that? Yeah. yeah. Offers a way of thinking about transatlantic cultural production as not being specifically African American, Caribbean, or British, but rather as constituting a borderless countercultural arena for art, literature, music, that is infused with the legacy of slavery. And that's what he means by the slave sublime. So Gilroy, as I said, um, thinks about Morrison as being crucial in the work of the Black Atlantic. Uh, and it now includes the work of intellectuals consciously writing within a transnational framework from beyond the na nation state. So Gilroy's work marks a turn in post-colonial studies 
towards thinking in terms of diasporas and more recently to theorizations of cosmopolitanism and the transnation. They're often very utopian in their delineation and imbued with political and aesthetic ideals that find their expression in the fluidity of diasporic experience itself. So considerations of the relationship between the periphery, the periphery being and the metropolitan centre, I'll just repeat that, the periphery constituted by those from former far off colonies and the metropolitan centre, thinking of London and uh, other European cities, have reoriented post-colonial studies towards new configurations of the transnational and the global. So we have some quite laudable aspirations of the transnation to be borderless, to be anti-nationalist. However, these aspirations risk being subsumed by globalisation and its new flows of data, labour and money. Uh, and Toni Morrison, in uh, her most recent um, work of non-fiction before she died, in The Origin of Others, uh, talked about the dangers of globalisation and the fears that globalisation might engender. She was concerned with transnationalism in its manifestation as globalisation, especially in terms of our faith in its assertions of progressiveness as being symptomatic of what she calls uh, the yearning for control and unity in a volatile world. So countering validations of the benign dispensations of globalisation, Morrison considers its dystopian aspects. She writes, uh, and this is on the screen, we fear its disregard of borders, national infrastructures, local bureaucracies, internet censors, tariffs, laws and languages, its heedlessness of margins and marginal people, its formidable engulfing properties, accelerating erasure, a flattening out of meaningful difference. So what we have here really is the tensions between an idealisation of a transnational diasporic um, culture and identity that's offset by some of the kind of more, um, problem, the, more of the difficulties with globalisation, which might mean the flattening out of meaningful difference and the fear uh, that it might engender of the loss of certain identities. So we can think then uh, really about various problems that there might be with a sort of transnational um, or an idealisation of the transnation and transnationalism. Uh, and we can also think perhaps about the problematisation of using Walter Benjamin uh, to think about uh, remembrance of the past. Because for the more recent critics, the idea that we should memorialise uh, slavery and um, rely on this idea of the slave sublime, this sort of romancing uh, this moment and constantly memorialising it is perhaps problematic. Uh, so the motifs of memory and repetition in Black Atlantic was constantly returning to the middle passage in this moment of slavery, this, these motifs of memory and repetition in Black Atlantic articulations of a redemptive slave past are problematic in terms of both their application to the institutions of slavery in America and their relevance for contemporary post-colonial theorisations generally. Uh, as Yogita Goyle uh, notes in um, her article Africa and the Black, Black Atlantic, um, the melancholic Historicism at work here relies on the axiom that racial injustice in the present can only be understood by recovering the slave past. So 
again, to use the example of what is happening in America at the moment, do we try and understand um, this moment by referring back uh, to the slave past? Or is that problematic because it's always involving a kind of melancholic historicism? Um, and Morrison herself, uh, Tony Morrison, has problematized any uh, static memorialization of the traumatic past, um, most noticeably in A Mercy, um, which is a novel that's set pre-slavery, um, although it's a 1998 novel, Paradise, that this shift is most apparent, apparent um, because it's here that Morrison critiques black nationalism and this immutable inscription of the past. The characters in that novel, some of them, just cannot get beyond uh, this moment in the past, um, this moment of racial exclusion. And she, she really criticises that. And even in a, her earlier novel, Jazz, in, in 1997, she's privileging sort of fluid and improvisational creativity in its title, Jazz. Um, you know, it's this uh, improvisation that can be the source of alleviation for the slave past. So the question now becomes one of whether the sort of classic paradigm of Black Atlantic cultural criticism that we see in Gilroy has the theoretical flexibility necessary for the negotiation of what we might call a neoliberal present in order to, in Yogata Goyle's words, imagine a future that is post-racial in a utopian rather than a colorblind sense. Um, the question of how history and memory can be narrativized and received today is perhaps of what's at stake. And Goyle writes, again, it's on your screen, the quandary about how to read history may be rethought by turning not just back in time to the beloved moment, slavery, uh, but across in space diasporic and global engagements with slavery and to the different histories of race and empire that African writers bring to the conversation. At stake in the discussion is the basic question of how we see the relation between past and present, particularly between historical violence and contemporary forms of This is really rare what you call it, the romance of the diaspora, this idea that we might uh, tend to romanticise uh, these moments in the past. So she's really calling for new conceptualisations of the diaspora that help nuance Black Atlantic thinking by rejecting the sort of homogenisation of history and experience and resisting this idea of the romance of the diaspora. And Goyle, in her article, points to new African literature, um, for example, the novel Americana by Adichie. Um, these examples, for her, destabilise earlier conceptualizations of diaspora and facilitate an approach to black Atlantic uh, theorizations of memory and modernity in the reconstellated perspectives that can accommodate new um, African and Caribbean subjectivities. So these incorporate versions of blackness, including Afropolitanism, uh, that are not defined by the Middle Passage and slavery, and as such uh, constitute re reconfigurations of, if not a complete break from the sort of melancholy of the slave sublime or the romance of the diaspora, as the means to understanding contemporary multiple subjectivities of people of African descent. But of course, as Goyle notes, however, within such literary reconfigurations of Africa, the ghosts of the past still remain. And moreover, contemporary thematic expressions of post-coloniality may be readily appropriated within a kind of neoliberal narrative that political intent subsumed beneath a, an assimilated, commodified, cosmopolitanism of the exoticized African subject. So Goyle is referring here to Afropolitan identity as a kind of cultural capital style without substance, commodifying a newly exotic 
cosmopolitan identity. So there exists a tension between the embrace of new nationalisms, of, say the new African countries or the new countries that emerged out of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan and so on, those new nationalisms forged from the decolonization of former colonial territories and the pull of borderlessness inherent in global connectivity. So this raises the question of how post-colonial literary expression and criticism may resist the homogenizing impulse of globalization itself to find meaning in specific localities. And the post-colonial uh, theorist Bill Ashcroft, uh, what he has termed the transnation, um, contains the potential for accommodating difference and new imaginings of the future that are themselves the fruit of memory, the product of literary expression, informed paradoxically by the existence of those very borders designed to exclude its utterance. So in other words, he's arguing that where you have borders, people are bound to transgress them. So actually, borders enable transgressive, radical uh, expression. So it's to what he calls the transnation that Ashcroft looks for the expression by which such exclusion, the way in which people are excluded by borders, may be alleviated. And he writes, the proliferation of states of exception, this is on your screen, uh, the proliferation of states of exception and the increase in surveillance reveal that the sovereignty of the state is ever more inimical to the freedom of national subjects and the fluidity of the transnation becomes an important element of hope for the nation living around the structures of the state. The transnation is the fluid migrating outside of the state that begins within the nation. The transnation is a way of talking about subjects in their ordinary lives, subjects who live in between the categories by which subjectivity is normally constituted. So uh, what he's arguing um, is that in fact uh, we can we can have a borderless world. It's not a utopian ideal, um, but we have to transgress uh, these borders. And again, this is an anti-nationalist um, state, uh, so it's utopian in that sense, uh, and also in its borderlessness, but it allows the possibility of um, the fluidity of the diaspora and expression. And also, um, he hopes that the transnation will also allow for difference, so that that flattening out of difference that Morrison identified as being a problem with globalization uh, is not um, uh, an issue in the transnation. Uh, so Ashcroft recognizes uh, the border as more than a physical entity, not, not just a wall, again thinking about Trump's uh, wall between Me America and Mexico, it's more than just a physical entity uh, and in Britain we've had a lot of talk about borders and protecting our borders that led to Brexit. Uh, it's more than just a physical entity, it's a practice by which these ideological constructs are deployed to reinforce the sort of insider-outsider binary in the name of uh, global capitalism, often under the guise of a perceived threat to security. So he talks about the way in which we now have um, the camp, again, the refugee camp and so on, that these are all ways in which uh, we can sort of police our borders uh, and that we see versions within the nation state of the same structures of, of exclusion that operate on a global scale. So we render certain people within our borders as lawless, the indigenous, the homeless, the non-citizen, the refugee, uh, banished to the extremes of civil society in camps, uh, the migrant of indeterminate status. Uh, all of the Ashcroft are sort of constructed as kind of barbarians, uh, necessary 
for the exclusionary affirmation of identity and belonging within the host culture. So thus, the way in which capitalism, expansionist capitalism operates, um, its rationalities of spatial and economic dominion are applied within and without the borders of the nation state as the hegemonic uh, imperialist cartographies of old find their contemporary reflection in the surveillance and control of citizens excluded from appropriated and once public space suddenly demarcated as private property. So again, whole areas of London are now demarcated as private property and people, uh, citizens are excluded from them and banished to come camps on the um, in Kent and so on. So, going back to my original point is how does all of this relate to the way we might want to read post-colonial literature and what does it mean for the study of literature or the writing of literature? Well, uh, literature is central for resisting the appropriation of language, temporality, space, identity and belonging. And writers like Sam Rushdie and the Nigerian novelist Ben Okri are amongst authors cited by Toni Morrison as sources of literature as remembrance and empathy. And reading then becomes a kind of social act that helps create the foundations for informed and meaningful citizenship of the world. So literary creation and its reception can alleviate the pessimism of much sort of contemporary thinking about the, our, the times we live, on, live in and our futures as, uh, under globalisation and can resist this rush into the past, this idea of making America great or Brexit, um, so that such an unimaginable horizon has encouraged from Morrison um, and she says that time does have uh, a future worthy of imagination. So this resist, re resistance to a return to a sort of idealised past when um, we had Great Britain or to make America great again, that kind of ideology. Instead, post-colonial literature for Morrison has the power uh, to help us imagine a future. And she writes, uh, in the future of time, this is from uh, Mouthful of Blood, which is published in America as the source of self-regard, her last uh, final collection just before she died of essays uh, from the past. So this was written in 1996. And she writes, perhaps it is the reality of a future as durable and far-reaching as the past, a future that will be shaped by those who have been pressed to the margins, the diaspora, by those who have been dismissed as a relevant surplus, by those who have been cloaked with the demon's cape. Perhaps it is the contemplation of that future that has occasioned the tremble of latter-day prophets, afraid that the current disequilibrium is a stirring, not an erasure, that not only is history not dead, but that it is about to take its first unfettered breath. And I want to end with that sort of optimistic note, in a way, um, that she's really seeing that the future of hum humanity lies in the writing of people like, um, she just uses the example of Rushdie and Lockery, but we can think of others and perhaps her own work as well. Um, that really this pessimism about uh, where we're going, um, particularly at the moment with pandemics and uh, rioting on the streets of America, might, anxiety and fear about that, might actually um, be ameliorated um, by the idea that we can reawaken history. So I'll leave it there. Hello? 
Hello, Dicto. Hello. Yes. Yeah. I can hear you well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like to take any questions if anyone has any. Okay. Um, I will just turn the um, audio from lecture to uh, mute conference. So whoever would like to ask a question, you can just um, unmute or herself or himself uh, and then talk to Dr. Justine right away. I'll start uh, myself with a question, Dr. Justine. Uh, I'm taking the advantage of being um, a host here. <laughs> All right. Um, do you think that um, Brexit or, or the wall that Donald Trump is waving with is going to create a contemporary diaspora? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, I, I, can't, I can't hear you. I'll just go to... Dr. Justine, would you please unmute yourself? Because I muted all and then allow people to unmute themselves. Oh, that's why. <laughs> Sorry. Have you managed to hear yeah. my, my question? Uh, yeah, can you, can you repeat it? Yes. Yes. Do you think that Brexit, or the UK separates from the EU, or the uh, wall that Donald Trump is waving with, is going to create a contemporary diaspora? I think so, yes. Within the nation borders. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and they already have. Delay. You already have? Sorry. Yes, we, well, I mean, we already have them, but I think it's going to be a re emphasizing of those borders. Um, so, for example, there's a lot of fear and anxiety about people crossing the channel. Um, just last week, you know, a, a, a boat mm -hmm. came across the channel with Iraqi, you know, um, people on it. Um, and this idea of well, what we're going to do with them, we're going to put them in a camp, basically, and create this sort of internal um, Hello? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Dr. Ahmed. Yes, I can, we can hear you. Yes. Would you like yes, to ask a question? I have a question. Yeah, please. Please go ahead. We can hear you right away. Right. Yeah, going. Uh, thank you. I, I really um, appreciate your own efforts. Uh, make a meeting such type of interesting meeting actually with the Professor Justin. Uh, hi, Professor Justin. Uh, would you like just to, uh, I want to remind you with the last uh, three or four sentences that you have ended uh, your speech with. Uh, actually, you may correct me, please. You mentioned that Morrison uh, always emphasizing that the future will be bright uh, and, and prosperous when we uh, go back to the past. Uh, yes. I mean, what type of what type of past Morrison wants to, to go back to? Uh, if we can guess that the, the, the American past was was really full of um, um, uh, uh, let us say racial injustice or 
something like that. So things, it comes like this introductory. Would you please explain to me? Thank you. Uh, yes, that, that's an excellent question. Um, of course, this is the problem is that going back to the past is very painful. Uh, and this is uh, in her novel, Beloved. Yeah, she goes back to the, to, to, the, you know, to, to the period of slavery and she actually brings... Um, a slave girl back to life as a, uh, well, as a, she's a ghost, uh, but it's such a painful experience for everybody in the novel. But out of that, by imaginatively reconfiguring that real experience and that pain, she hopes that she can somehow uh, gain some redemptive future out of it by reliving the trauma, I suppose. Um, <coughs> and for many people that is now problematic. Um, whether we should constantly sort of revisit this moment in the past um, and whether we can revisit such a painful moment and it be redemptive and offer possibilities for the future. You mean, I mean like you using you mean like using um, memory and dream memory as part of yep. healing the trauma? Yes. Yeah. So getting back in memory to the past just to heal the present and the future. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. That answer your question, Dr. Ahmed. No, not at Okay. Okay, fine, no problem. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Dr. Tyler. <coughs> Thank you so much for your question. Thanks a lot. But I, you notice I don't, I don't actually answer the question because Morrison does not herself. Well, as you know, um, Dr. Allah, uh, at the end of um, Beloved, she says this is not a story to pass on. Pass on, absolutely, yes. Oh, but at the same like, time, this is not a story to pass by. This is not a story yes. to forget. So yes. she doesn't answer that question herself. No, not at all. As, as if the last sentence, getting, back to, getting us back to the beginning of it, not just yes. a story, but the history and the, and, and the incident of the past yes. that all the uh, African-American slaves went through. Thank yes. you so much. Anyone with any other question? Uh, Mr. Asim? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I'd like first to thank you very much, in fact, for this uh, uh, very nice uh, lecture, uh, Professor Bailey, and to thank you, Dr. Ala, for giving me the chance. I have thank just so uh, two comments us. and a question. First, we mm -hmm. all know that history is written, rewritten by the victorious, the hegemony. Yeah culture and the colonizer always, who impose uh, uh, their own imprint on the uh, political, social and, uh, in fact, uh, s structure of, of the people. Uh, but uh, wh what I want to say is, why do we always blame it on the, the mat historical materialism, or the, what uh, we call this, uh, I mean, the productive systems and the power relationships? I, f I believe that it is not only these which have uh, contributed to this uh, slave uh, bloody chapter, the bloody chapter of slavery in America or elsewhere. I believe that literature also to be blamed here. Don't you think that uh, the early, especially Euro Euro European canonical authors ha started this process of othering the, the marginal uh, or ethnic major minorities in their books? Like Shakespeare, for example. When we yes. read Shakespeare, maybe we will say that Shakespeare was a racist in spite of himself, whether he was aware of this or, or not. So I believe that history, by, by putting the, the slaves in certain negative stereotypes, has also contributed to this, uh, this uh, crisis. This is number one. Number, yes. Yes. Number, yes. number two, uh, I read a book by Francis Fanon called Black yes. Skin, White Mask. He, yes. he, said we shouldn't, uh, he, he said we shouldn't blame, blame it on the white superiority complex. 
the blacks also suffer a kind of inferiority complex because they lack confidence in their culture and their own yeah. identity and hence they try always to 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 uh, to imitate the, the whites and and they appear in a kind of a peripheral surrogate because they they lo- they, they live in a kind of liminal uh, consciousness they are neither yeah. blacks nor nor whites yes so, uh, i believe that the, the, the blacks themselves are are to be blamed for, for this. And thank you very much, in fact, for this uh, interesting lecture. Yeah, that's very interesting about Fanon. I mean, because he's talking about the Comprador class, isn't he? Um, which which co- co- copy, yeah, the, the Western values. And he said that they, that they had no chance of being free from colonialism without um, creating a whole new system of governance, not to copy Europe, yes. Yeah. No, that's a brilliant point, yeah. Thank you. Yes, so please, Dr. Ala, if you allowed me. Please, Mr. Hamad, go on, please. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Justin, for being here with us. And um, I really appreciate your valuable lecture, especially what concerns with diaspora. Um, actually, I, I used to look for diaspora. I have a comment and two questions about that comment, if you don't mind. Of course. Actually, I, I used to look for diaspora as only the scattering of population outside their indigenous territories. Yes. But I think it can be employed in a larger scope, and that is to be within a state of transnationality. So my question, my two questions are that, could diaspora be considered in the critical analysis to refer to the dispersion of people inside the country and the state of I outside think, of uh, it? I think so. And yes. the, second, uh, yeah, yeah, the second question, could also diaspora be mainly used to indicate not only for people scattering, but also for the disintegration of the principles social attitude, especially in a post-war society, and within the same country also, especially such people are still living in a society full of hybrid and liminal conditions, which are mm-hmm. main elements of diaspora. And thank you yes. very much, uh, Dr. That's a um, very um, interesting question. Um, well, I suppose that each nation state or um, area had its own different experiences of the way in which it configures um, its, its diasporas if you like um, I mean what would, what would you say would, what, would have, what, what would you think would be the answer Uh, I was just asking what you thought yourself. Yes, I think I think it can be used, uh, uh, and I we, I will come with the uh, great actually results. Special, for example, I will give you an example. Uh, Iraq can be a, a perfect example for such um, uh, for such a study because there is a dispersion here uh, inside the country. I can uh, make research, many research papers about, uh, the, for example, the national uh, struggles that happened and make people, uh, tear, uh, may, may make people are torn with each other. So I think, in my opinion, that uh, such countries or such societies are perfect, um, are perfect uh, stuff for uh, a research paper concerning the diaspora. But I will take it from another perspective. Yes, now that's a really interesting perspective. I suppose that's one of the things about what we're doing this evening, really, isn't it? It's crossing these sort of yes. borders. Yes, and especially, especially, sorry, especially there's a liminality also. People are still in between whether to live here or there, whether to be in a certain place within the same country or to be uh, only, for example, in the north or in the south. So a dis- disintegration is still there and people are living with that, uh, with that confusion. And thank you, thank you very much, Victor. Yes, thank you, thank you. That was a really interesting observation. 
Is there any more questions? Sorry. Um, are there any more questions? Dr. Justine, I, I, I will ask one question. Just uh, um, whether transnationalism, transnationalism is part of diaspora, is it? Or is it different face or different face? Uh, yes, yeah, that's a good question. And Ashcroft does try and address that. He says it's more than diaspora because okay. a diasporic identity might still identify, say, with um, the African country that, that it originated from or Bangladesh or wherever. Mm -hmm. But the transnationalism doesn't identify with any particular nation, like national okay. identity. So mm -hmm. he's saying it goes, it's more than diaspora. Because diaspora, as we know, is sort of fluid and hybrid and all that bit. But the idea is transnationalism is you don't identify with any one particular country at all. So you might be Nigeria and come to London. You don't become nationally British, uh, but you also don't cling on to a Nigerian national identity either. The, I see. The, you know, they were living in a sort of, uh, what does he call it, unrepresentational uh, undecidability. In other words, it's uh, a sort of liminal as the word that your previous questioner um, used, which is probably very good. Uh, way to describe it, um, a liminal identity or in-between identity. But yes, it goes further than diaspora because if you're diasporic, you might still have an identity that's linked to the country that you originally came from. So, Thank you. whether you agree Thank with him or not. Yes. So, can we say if, if those refugees from Syria in, in the EU, in Europe, if they publish yeah. their own literature, that will be diasporic more than transnationalism, unless they are the citizens of that country. I would say so, yes. That they, uh, he would say that to be sort of fixated on sort of original national pride rooted in the yeah. past would, mm -hmm. would not make them necessarily transnational. So the examples he uses are artists like Ai Weiwei and um, you know, sort of Chinese originally, but doesn't have kind of identification with you know, um, China as, you know, as a nationalist. Um, filmmakers like Ang Lee, for example, you know, who can make sense and sensibility, and um, you know, the Incredible Hulk. You know, that these are people. Though he was. Sort of, I think has Chinese origins, but was, grew up in Malaysia. You know, but these are privileged people who can jet around the world. You know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and Kashi Ushiguru is another one of his examples. Um, Japanese British novelist. Um, nice. He doesn't have any fixation on any one particular identity. But again, you could say they're all very privileged, middle class people who have that freedom to. Um, Move the so that's what I mean about transnationalism. You could regard it as a bit utopian and idealised. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your answer. Uh, is there are there any more questions, or we may end here? You can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask any question. Okay. I believe that's it. I didn't yes. receive any notifications for further well, questions. It's very late in Iraq now, isn't it? So, well, yes. thank you very much, all of you, for uh, thank attending. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for your time and your nice presentation and your formative lecture. We really appreciate your efforts and your help. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, yes. Thanks, everyone, for being with us uh, this evening. Um, and I hope to see you all in other sessions of El Iraqi University. Thank you, Dr. Justine you. you. Bailey, for her participation and her contribution to our community. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye.